So, so maybe then we move now to the first talk by Stefan Sint. Are you there? Yes, here. Yeah, I am. Wonderful. Okay. You want to try to share your slides? Yes. Let's see. Um. Thank you. So Stefan will let, um, tell us about an update of our price from FLAG, and he will also cover part of the presentation that should have been given by Andreas Kronfeld, who couldn't make it. So his presentation will be a little bit longer, 45 minutes. Thank you very much, Stefan, also for stepping in at the last moment. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julia. And um, yeah, so I'm, I wanted to report on um, on our flag uh, working group um, that I'm uh, I'm the speaker of the working group and uh, the other members are Roger Horsley in Edinburgh and Peter Petretsky in Brookhaven. And um, so here's the outline of my talk. I first want to say a few words about flag, then make some general observations on determinations of alpha s, and uh, then get to the definitions of an effective alpha and the lambda parameter, how it is connected, uh, that will lead us to the flag criteria for uh, determinations of alpha s. Then I will get to the problem with large scale differences and then uh, present some new results for three flavors, um, from three, three flavor simulations, uh, which pass the flag criteria. And uh, then uh, um, discuss a little bit um, as an advertiser for the decoupling strategy, which is a new uh, method proposed by the alpha collaboration. And that will lead us to some uh, zero flavor results, actually, which are then, uh, uh, and, and then the conclusions. Okay, um, let me start with saying um, a few words about FLAG. So FLAG is the acronym for Flavor Lattice Averaging Group. And it's an effort by the international lattice community to provide the wider high energy physics community with lattice results uh, for various quantities that satisfy some clearly defined quality criteria. Um, so the original focus of FLAG was on flavor physics, but now FLAG also includes a section on alpha S and uh, for example, nucleon matrix elements and also some section on scale setting, although the focus is still very much on flavor physics. Uh, then uh, there is a website, here is the URL. Um, and so FLAG only uh, uses results that uh, besides passing the quality criteria also are accepted by or even published in a peer reviewed journal. It's not enough to have a preprint on the archive. And um, I mean, they can still be mentioned in the report, but uh, they will not enter any averaging. So the cutoff date for FLAC uh, 2021 was uh, last year in April, and uh, the link to the report is given here, and also the one to the previous one two years earlier, um, our well, FLAC 2019, is uh, here, and that's published in European Physics Journal. Now, um, I should uh, say this is a, meant to be a service to the wider physics community to have some quality filter basically uh, and to, 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 um, for non-experts to be able to use lattice results with some uh, qualifying criteria. But if people use them, uh, FLAG still insists very much that anyone using them should still cite the original sources. And that's a great fear of many lattice collaborations that uh, FLAG basically um, hovers up all the citations uh, because that's a review uh, of, of the, so, so the flag uh, urges people to um, still cite the original sources and they're easy to find in the flag report. Okay, so, so far to flag, then um, the list of new publications for Alpha S um, are listed here and there are various acronyms I will keep using throughout the talk. Uh, so there is the um, TUM QCD uh, um, 19 paper, that's Bazarov et al by the TUEM QCD collaboration. And uh, then there are Ayala Lopregat Pineda, that's Ayala 20, uh, this paper here. And then 
who is on the first, if there's a number of authors, it's the first author in the, in the year. And, um, and otherwise it's a maybe collaboration name. So there are these, um, so there are new papers in static, in static energy and force for two plus one flavors and zero flavors. Then heavy quark current two point functions, uh, again, two plus one flavors by Petretsky and uh, Weber. I think we will hear about um, the continuation of that. Uh, and another paper by Voito and Matteo. And then uh, on QCD vertices of Aeropolis, then uh, a paper by um, Carly et al., um, which is, I, I should have put the reference, it's published, of, of course, by now in Physics First of Letters. Then there is this uh, paper on the decoupling strategy by the Alpha Corporation, and uh, then some zero flavor results on step scaling and finite volume by Dalla Brida and Ramos and uh, Alessandro Nada and Ramos. And we will probably hear about these results in the afternoon. Okay, some general observations about uh, uh, determinations of alpha S. Um, so in the flag 19 average, uh, the uncertainty is about 0.7%. And um, that's the position that uh, uh, current status of, of lattice uh, QCD determinations. And all but one determinations are NF equals two plus one combined with four loop matching across charm and bottom thresholds. And then uh, a 1% error on alpha S requires essentially on the lambda parameter for three flavors, an error that's less than 5% as a rule of thumb. And the lambda parameter is a, it has units of a scale, it's an energy scale. So um, isospin breaking effects due to electromagnetism and also mass differences are not really relevant for alpha S at this level well, of precision for a scale. And so they can be safely neglected. And um, then there's a majority of determinations, they are affected by systematics, in particular perturbative truncation errors, which require that the scale is much larger than the lambda parameter. And uh, then also the continuum limit requires that the scale is still much smaller than, uh, than the inverse lattice spacing, A is the lattice spacing. Now, um, I have mentioned here decoupling uh, across these charm and bottom thresholds that's uh, being used in perturbation theory, but there is a very nice test by Atito et al. in 2018. They actually uh, tested perturbative um, decoupling um, across <laughs> bottom and uh, charm and bottom. They tested uh, decoupling in perturbation theory versus non-perturbative uh, decoupling. And uh, the perturbative description is, is quantitatively very, very accurate. And uh, uh, with that knowledge, it's actually enough to uh, get a result for alpha S, the five flavor in the five flavor theory by just looking, by just determining the lambda parameter in three or maybe four flavors. Okay, so that uh, lends support to, to this procedure. Okay. Um, so now let's see how we proceed if we determine a lattice uh, a coupling on the, on the lattice. So the starting point for all these determinations is some Euclidean short distance quantity that we call Q here, uh, that obviously must be measurable in a lattice simulation. And on the other hand, it must have a perturbative expansion. Uh, Q is some constant plus uh, order alpha plus some term order alpha squared. And uh, we need to know at least the first few terms for that. And um, in order to define an effective coupling that can be associated to this, this observable, we just subtract the constant piece and then divide by the leading term of alpha so that alpha effective has a perturbative series that starts with alpha, um, uh, some other alpha that I want to convert to, uh, typically the MS bar coupling. Now, the advantage of this alpha effective is that there is no need to refer to a particular scale. Um, alpha effective is just the observable, just normalized such that it, uh, it is uh, equal to uh, some coupling in perturbation theory. But um, uh, so there is no, no need to, to um, specify a, a scale. An exception would be the couplings that are defined at one over A 
from, uh, that are defined from small Wilson loops. But I won't talk about these this time because essentially this is supposed to be the update from 2019 and there has been no new development on um, uh, Wilson loops and, and such couplings that are defined at the cutoff scale. Okay, um, so the loop counting then uh, that I'm uh, using here in this talk is that, uh, so alpha effective is normalized such that it starts with alpha. And there is, um, this, is this is kind of the tree level, uh, even though it always, in many cases, it requires a one loop calculation to just uh, get this uh, definition of alpha effective. And then uh, D1 would be the one loop coefficient, D2 the two loop, and so on, three loop. So the counting here is that uh, D sub K, um, if it's known up to NL, um, then the loop order is NL. So the currently best cases that we know have uh, uh, the loop number three in this counting. And there is some partial information also on the fourth loop in the case of the static potential of the force. All right. So how is this related to the lambda parameter? So the lambda parameter in a mass independent randomization scheme is simply the solution of the kalin zimanski equation. And you can write down the exact solution uh, if, you're, um, if you have a coupling that is uh, defined as a defined function of the scale, then you can write down this uh, um, exact solution. So if the coupling is non-perturbatively defined, then also its beta function is then non-perturbatively defined just as the scale variation of this coupling. And, uh, but at high, at, at small couplings, it can be, it can be also expanded in perturbation theory, of course, and with the usual one and two loop uh, universal coefficients B0 and B1, which I've written down here in my uh, uh, normalization. So at large mu, um, one, in order to get the lambda parameter from, uh, um, from this expression, one would at large mu, one would like to uh, evaluate, so large mu means that g bar at mu is small, so one can evaluate this integrant in perturbation theory, and uh, or be, one can put in the, be, the perturbative beta function here and then evaluate this, this integral um, numerically or in, in an expansion in g bar. So at large mu, one uses the perturbative beta function to nl loops, which uh, means that B and L plus one is known in this counting here to replace the beta function here in red by this uh, perturbative approximation. And then the estimate that one gets by doing so, the estimated lambda parameter over the uh, true lambda parameter is one plus order alpha to the N L. That would be the uh, parametric uncertainty that one has if one has the beta function at N L loops. Okay. Um, in the working group for alpha S in, for FLAG 2021, we opted to keep the criteria unchanged from, from the previous FLAG uh, report. And the criteria are as follows. First is renormalization scale. Uh, we require that all points that enter the analysis have an effective alpha that's less than 0.2 if we want to reach a, a green star. So there's this color coding, there's a green star, an open a circle, open green circle, and otherwise there is a red uh, square. So a red square means that uh, the criteria are failed. And so either the stricter criterion to get a star would be alpha effective less than 0.2, or if all points have less than 0.4, at least one reaches uh, less than 0.25, that would be uh, an open circle and otherwise a red uh, square. So that's uh, a criterion for the renormalization scale. Then for perturbative behavior, uh, we um, attribute a green star if the behavior is verified over range of a factor four change in alpha effective to the NL. And this is if you go back one page uh, at the bottom. This is the parametric uncertainty in the determination of the lambda parameter from knowing the beta function to NL loops. So if that uncertainty can be varied by a factor four, that would be uh, um, a green star. Uh, alternatively, 
uh, if not assuming any power corrections, uh, I should say, uh, at here, or alternatively, if um, alpha n effective to the power nl is less than half times this expression here, if that is the case, then uh, we also associate uh, attribute a, a green star. Now, where does this right hand side here come from? Uh, basically, if you look at the lambda parameter um, at the uncertainty or the, the variation in the lambda parameter induced by a variation of alpha, then you can just write this as delta alpha times the lambda by d, the alpha propagating this uncertainty. And then uh, the lambda by the alpha is simply uh, essentially proportional to lambda over the beta function, because that's just here uh, the um, Karl Zimanski equation, and this is an exact solution to it. So you get this expression here with two pi, uh, pi delta alpha over minus the beta function times g. And if you, if you uh, convert to alpha, then you get this uh, right-hand side here. So if you take the relative error in lambda induced by the change in alpha, then you get uh, this expression here. Um, asymptotically, uh, uh, by approximating the, the, the beta function here to, to lowest order. And uh, then um, with the factor one half, we, we um, so this essentially means that the systematic effect that we expect is still less than the, um, um, say, statistical errors that you have in your observable that would also induce the uncertainty in lambda. So you're still dominated by uh, statistics. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, a slightly lesser criterion is to, in, in, instead of having a factor of four, you, you take a three, three half squared, so 2.25. And uh, um, the same um, right hand side, but with the factor one instead of one half. And otherwise, uh, we get a red square. So these criteria here do not actually refer anywhere to the lattice. That could also be applied to uh, any other determination uh, in phenomenology. Now, uh, the specific lattice criterion is uh, about the continuum limit. At a reference point of uh, alpha effective being 0.3 or less, we require that there are at least three different lattice spacings that satisfy mu a less than 0.5. And the action is fully order A improved and the operators that are uh, needed. Either this or three lattice spacings, which are um, uh, in where the scale in, in lattice units is less than one quarter, and two loop order A improvement, or even less one eighth if uh, we only have one loop order A improvement. Okay, so the less improved your action, the, the, the finer your lattice has to be. So that is basically the criterion for the green star. If um, a, a open green circle uh, relaxes this, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, as you can see here. Now, uh, there is a convention obviously implied for mu, uh, the scale mu in different quantities. For example, if we have a momentum space observable, then we set mu equals to this momentum. Or in the step scaling, um, u is 1 over l, where l is the linear extent of the space-time volume, um, and so on. And so there are various uh, conventions um, that are implied for, for, this, for what is the scale, uh, how is the scale defined here. Good. Now, uh, let me just quickly mention the problem that one has, uh, the challenge, basically, that one has in, in uh, in lattice determination, here is again the expression for the lambda parameter. So this is a continuum relation exact at any scale mu. But as we mentioned before, it requires large mu because we want to evaluate this integral from, from large energy to infinite energy, so zero coupling, in perturbation theory. And for that, we need to reach large mu. So we need to reach the perturbative regime where we can do that. On the other hand, the lattice cutoff must still be larger than that. And um, then the, the spatial volume must be large enough to contain the hadronic states I'm, uh, I'm measuring. And the lighter states are usually the pions. So L must typically be larger than, uh, much, much larger than the uh, inverse, the, the Compton wavelength of the pion. And if you, if you combine these requirements, uh, then you have a couple of much larger than 
a three actually here, and uh, L over A must be very large. You might say uh, of the order of hundreds, if not thousand. And this is just a reflection of the fact that very different scales, namely here the cutoff scale, the perturbative large energy scale, and then the the um, um, hadronic scale, the pion here, uh, which must still fit into the, the box of my uh, space uh, spatial volume. Uh, these are very different scales, and they cannot be resolved simultaneously on a single lattice without compromising. So uh, there is actually a strategy to to avoid this, to completely solve this problem, which it goes by the name of step scaling. Uh, it's, which is a multi-lattice approach. You basically do not never represent all scales on a single lattice. Uh, if you don't want to go down this route, uh, then you have to make various compromises, and uh, then uh, yeah, then you may be hit by by systematic errors that you cannot reduce. Okay. So having said that, I want to illustrate this problem with uh, an example from uh, from the new results that actually did pass the flag criteria. It's a paper by Carly et al, where they used the light quark current two-point function in position space. So it's basically like the vacuum polarization, uh, except that it's not done in momentum space, but in position space. And there is uh, actually no summation over x. This is directly in, uh, there's no, uh, no summation over spatial uh, x or whatever. It's, it's directly in, in, in position space. And one defines the, from the current current correlator, um, either axial or vector currents, defines this function CA or CV. And then in perturbation theory, they are actually have the same expansion. And uh, so there is by dimensional reasons, dimension six. So there's x squared cubed. That is, that's in, uh, it, in the chiral limit, I should say. And then there's one plus order alpha and higher orders. Now, um, in order to define the effective alpha, then you would have to take um, the, this current correlator, multiply by, by this um, inverse prefactor here, um, and then subtract the one, which is the constant part, and uh, multiply by, by the inverse of the coefficient of alpha to get something that has an expansion starting with alpha. So this is our effective uh, coupling here, uh, which where mu, okay, um, mu is uh, assumed in this, uh, in this uh, correlation function to be the distance, uh, Euclidean distance between uh, the two currents. Okay, so uh, these authors, Carly et al, they use a distance between 0.13 and 0.19 Fermi. They use a CLS uh, set of lattice configurations, which has lattice spacings between 0.0 39 and 0.076 Fermi. And then their effective alphas, they vary between 0.23, 0 0.235 and 0.31 roughly, uh, once they have extrapolated them to the carry limit. So they actually have non perturbative order A improved with three lattice spacings at, uh, at this final scale. And uh, so they satisfy uh, a green star for continuum extrapolation. But you see, uh, you should see here, uh, this is a plot here of this observable made dimensionless by multiplying by x to the six, x to the six here, um, versus the distance, which is the inverse scale at a fixed lattice spacing here. And you see uh, the leading, uh, the tree level continuum is the um, is this line here, and then and then you have the Lattice data are these uh, yellow points, and then you correct for tree-level cutoff effects, and you get the red points, and then you uh, you correct for for one-loop uh, lattice artifacts, and you get the the um, the blue points. So, if without doing that correction, I mean, you wouldn't be able to apply the method. So that's uh, um, and they do that using actually an extra simulation using stochastic perturbation theory. In order to divide out this this uh, hyperplane, I guess the overuse done totally to thirty, right? Sorry, what? Uh, is there a question or um, any comment? No, uh, maybe someone. Was my mistake. Someone forgot to unmute. 
uh, to mute. Uh, anyway, um, uh, if not, there's no question, I continue. Uh, um, so here on the right picture, you see actually, um, you see the difference between uh, here in the inlet vector and axial vector current. That's why I put this picture essentially. So you see that um, one actually sees the, uh, well, here's the left is the axial, right is the vector current that when you extrapolate to uh, the continuum limit, they tend to agree, which is a good sign in, in the in sense that, that um, in perturbation theory, a vector and axial vector are the same because um, any difference is a sign for uh, um, chiral symmetry breaking, and that's a non-perturbative effect, purely non-perturbative. And so they, they show the absence of these non-perturbative effects. And uh, so then they, um, they extract the lambda parameter here over a range of, the, of, of scales, and this is their um, coupling versus the inverse uh, uh, scale um, on, the, on the right hand side. And if one applies the flag criteria for the perturbative behavior, then alpha effective cube covers a range of 2.2, which is pretty close to the um, round circle, but actually um, the uh, the error on, on the observable is around four to six percent. That's actually com comfortably larger than the relative parametric uncertainty of lambda. So with a stronger criterion, actually still being okay. So they actually get a green star for that. And they also reach a coupling that's less than 0.25 for minimization scale, they get a, uh, an open circle. So they actually pass all the flag criteria. Uh, despite uh, some reservations one might have if one looks at these data. Okay, so actually this error estimate seems rather optimistic. Uh, they have the, um, yeah, the error is, is, is 17 and 342 for the lambda parameter. That's a pretty good error. And uh, it seems uh, rather optimistic. Um, so they show this effect of these non-perturbative effects in, in, in high assembly breaking, but of course there are other non-perturbative effects that affect, uh, that are not sensitive to chirality and, and, and these can still be there. And then what they do is they convert, uh, the series is actually known in perturbation theory uh, to um, a three loop order in, in, in our loop counting. Uh, so if we truncate the series here, so what they do is they invert numerically. Um, so they have a number on the le left hand side with an error and they invert numerically to get alpha ms bar. But if one instead uses uh, perturbation theory to invert this series, then one obtains lambda ms bar in, in a range much higher, actually 15 to 30% higher. And although this difference decreases roughly proportionally to the expected alpha cubed, uh, this is uh, quite a large uncertainty. Uh, and uh, so what we did in, like we, we did for the, uh, we did accept this value, but we added the systematic, which is basically the difference between uh, these two ways of extracting, uh, extracting alpha ms bar. Uh, basically as a systematic error added, which more or less triple, uh, triples the error for, uh, for the lambda parameter in this case. So it's clearly dominated by systematic effects. Okay, then there are two, um, two uh, results for um, uh, the static energy. I'm sure we will hear about this um, uh, in later talks today by um, Nova Pambilla, I think. And uh, so, yeah, I, I should say they, they satisfy the criteria. Um, they have added final lattice spacing compared to earlier work from 2014. Uh, they check uh, systematic effect in lattice simulations that topology freezes at very fine lattice spacing. They find it does, but um, uh, they estimate it's irrelevant to what they, to their, to their observables at their level of precision. They um, reach now a scale that is 5.4 GeV, and the coupling is 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 less than 0.2. And uh, so, they get a result for the lambda parameter, which is uh, uh, 314 uh, MeV uh, with these errors, and. Uh, uh, they also did a check uh, in, in uh, using the free energy 
uh, where they assume that the thermal effects are negligible so that they can use a perturbation theory from the static energy and they find, uh, find this value for a similar value for the lambda parameter. But then the interesting thing, uh, well, that's that's nice, but uh, the interesting thing is that Ayala 20, they do not do any lattice calculations on their own. They are basically uh, people doing phenomenology and they use the subset of the lattice data to uh, do a perturbative analysis on top of it. And what they do, they do different uh, distance range, uh, then QCD for their analysis, somewhat lower energy actually, and they use, um, ultra soft log with summation. This quality, the static energy has this uh, infrared uh, problem that leads to log alpha terms at a uh, uh, higher loop order. And uh, there is some re summation they apply here and then they get a completely different, well, a completely quite a different result. We have 38 with an error of 12. Error is similar, but the central uh, Flag, flag, uh, flag criteria and, and they pass. And since both results are essentially equivalent, just different uh, uh, ways of analyzing perturbation theory, um, what we did is we took the difference in central values as the um, as a systematic error, which increases then the error uh, of uh, compared to each individual uh, determination. So that's what we what we did here. And so these are the, essentially the new results. Um, uh, I don't want to review the old ones here in the in this uh, um, um, update. Um, so here are all here's a plot now with all the um, uh, with all the various methods and there were categories of observables. There are uh, there's a step scaling approach. This is a result from 2017 by Alpha Corporation, and there's an earlier one from 2009 by a Japanese collaboration Pax CS. And then there is the um, a static potential, that's what we just uh, have seen on the previous page, the Ayala and uh, TUM QCD. And, uh, and then there is the uh, light current correlators, which is vacuum polarization. Uh, Kali et al is the first green uh, uh, point here entering the uh, average. And, this, and these are the Wilson loops. And uh, here are um, the heavy, current correlators and then here are vertex QCD vertices like uh, goes to on vertex etc they they have no uh, not passed the criteria yet and uh, the last one is uh, a 2018 paper um, on Dirac eigenvalues eigenvalue densities where they extract alpha s from there but the ones entering are basically five different categories here and what we do is we give a range in each of these uh, categories um, which includes then our estimate of systematic, and uh, and and then we average these ranges to get this average here um, uh, on top, this black uh, one. But then we do not actually add the errors in quadrature because, as you have seen in the previous slides, the errors are mostly systematic. And so what we do is we we take uh, we we took here the um, the only result which is dominated by statistics is uh, alpha 17, the step scaling approach. And uh, so we, we took the error of the step scaling approach as the um, as a proxy for the total error uh, with the central values obtained by, by averaging. Okay, so that is the uh, uh, outcome of that uh, analysis for alpha S. Um, maybe some discussion compared to 2019, there is a, almost no change uh, just uh, from in the last uh, quarter sigma, let's say it moved uh, up. Um, I have mentioned that the systematic errors are dominating here at uh, mostly due to perturbation theory at low in low scales. And there's also a nice review by Del Demio and Ramos uh, from uh, a couple of years ago, which I uh, recommend where they did a systematic analysis of and, and vary the scale uh, uh, to see uh, these, these uh, systematic effects. Now the current flag criteria may not be stringent enough anymore uh, as the example of Kali 20 demonstrates. But on the other hand, it may also be the occasional case where you the price have to pay the price for having basically uh, universal criteria that you want to apply across the board. It may always be an ex accidentally small coefficient in the uh, uh, uncertainty or 
alpha effective might be unusually small and then pass underneath the threshold. Um, and still, uh, there are effects which are um, quite worrisome uh, uh, if you look at the global picture. Anyway, um, I have mentioned that the first two criteria by FLAC could also be applied to any other determination, uh, non-lattice ones. That would be actually quite interesting. So um, um, I would say several methods are stuck with systematic that cannot be easily reduced uh, from now on. And it would be therefore very good if one could uh, do some step scaling solution uh, um, uh, to avoid perturbation theory at too low energies. And in, in many cases, the factor of 1.5 to 2 in the scale might make a big difference and could be feasible in large or infinite volume. And then finally, there's a promising new method based on non-perturbative decoupling of three quarks in combination, combination with step scaling in the zero flavor theory. And that will be discovered by Mattia Dallabrida and Alberto Ramos and also there's a nice review by Dalla Brida from last year. Um, I would like to just give you a flavor of that uh, uh, method, and which also then motivates uh, looking at uh, zero flavor uh, data again, which uh, for, for, where, where, where some effects can be can be dealt with in much more um, with much higher precision. Okay, so the coupling starts from this observation. Well, first the step scaling. Uh, result that was mentioned on the previous plot by alpha 17 uh, basically traces um, finite volume couplings in the three flavor theory from 0.2 uh, GeV to um, 120 GeV non-perturbatively. That's the whole evolution is, uh, is reconstructed non-perturbatively and then uh, perturbation theory is, is used at a hold of order 100 GeV only. So, uh, but this comes with the price that the error, it is actually not cheap to do this running in, in the SF coupling to, to construct this generalization group running. And the, the error is dominated by the high energy running of the SF coupling here in the high energy part. And therefore, um, uh, the decoupling strategy now builds on that and uh, one might use an F equals zero result for very precise running at high energies and then do at, at, at low energies uh, a matching of three flavor QCD to zero flavor QCD by simultaneous decoupling of three degenerative quarks. So basically one defines a scale uh, through the value of a, a coupling as a mass independent coupling. And one can use previous results, uh, alpha 17 to determine that, uh, to, to know what, what that scale is in, in units of MeV. And then one traces this coupling as one increases the quark mass M. M couple M stands for the RGI quark mass here. And there is a relation that one can establish of this form where um, uh, this equation here at the bottom, that the, you have the lambda parameter and units of that uh, scale, that low energy scale um, is the target quantity it multiplies a function P that is essentially giving the ratio of lambda parameters between three and zero flavors, but depends on the mass in, and, 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 and also on this uh, target quantity. So it's, it's, this is an implicit equation for, for, for the target. But the crucial observation is that this P function can be evaluated in perturbation theory with great accuracy and at for loop order. And uh, the previous work I mentioned before, uh, uh, when I was talking about charm and bottom thresholds, also applies here and, and tells us that this uh, perturbative approximation is a very good, uh, very good uh, quantitative description of this p function. And then one has a known ratio of lambda parameters and a, a function phi, which is the uh, kind of function I defined for the lambda parameter, which is now in the zero flavor theory. And there it is known from this from these uh, two uh, recent works. And what one needs then as input is the argument, which is given as the massive coupling that one needs to trace uh, to large masses in the three flavor theory. And this equation holds up to um, uh, power corrections in the mass, one over m squared. And of course, then if one uses here perturbation theory, then also in uh, um, uh, higher or and some high order in, in, in alpha MS bar at the heavy mass scale. So that is the um, uh, structure. And here is uh, from the 2019 letter, the um, extrapolation in the 
right, in one over m squared, so uh, to the zero, um, to the infinite mass limit. And here is the target quantity here. So you see that uh, um, actually the, the extrapolation, this is not the extrapolation, this is the flux NF equals three value from 2000, flux to 2019. And you see, this is very nicely compatible uh, if one were to extrapolate here. Um, this extrapolation was not done at the time in the letter, but today uh, there will be um, first results and details will be discussed by Alberto Ramos and Matilda Labrida. Okay, but uh, the important take home message here is also that um, we can uh, um, that uh, NF equals zero results actually directly enter now uh, result for the physical lambda parameter that determines alpha s, uh, uh, the physical alpha s at the z mass scale. So um, while NF equals zero was usually considered a test bed for, um, for, for trying out methods that would be, uh, so it would be cheaper to do uh, and you first try it out for in the, in the quenched approximation or zero flavor theory uh, before you uh, spend the resources in full uh, theory. This now uh, fundamentally changes if uh, uh, zero flavor results become actually part of the, uh, the um, determination of physical quantities. And therefore we should take them much more seriously well, uh, as before, and uh, we will as in flag uh, trace them. And there are actually some, a couple of nice uh, studies uh, by Mattia Dallabrida and Alberto Ramos and also uh, Ramos and Alessandro Nara in uh, in the last uh, two three years, and uh, we, we did step scaling studies using uh, the quenched approximation to pin down the lambda parameter into to high precision in in, in, in zero flavor. And uh, so here are the details for this Dalabrina paper. What they do is um, they use lattice sizes up to forty eight. Um, for step scaling functions, there's a factor of three. They, they cover in lattice spacing, so giving nice continuous extrapolations. Uh, they look at two different kinds of gradient flow couplings in finite volume. No time to define this here now. But uh, the three loop beta function for this for these schemes is known using um, stochastic perturbation theory for zero flavors in any case. And so that can be used. Um, because that's usually a problem in step scaling. Once you give up the infinite volume, then you also have to give up all the nice uh, high order perturbative results that people have worked so hard to get in infinite volume. So it's a very high price to pay, but here this could be replaced by a, a stochastic perturbation theory simulation that would actually give the free loop beta function. I should have given the reference here to um, Matilda Abrida and, and Martin Lusche. Okay. Um, the couplings are traced over a very wide range. Alpha effective actually varies by a factor of 12 and uh, reaches 0.08. So that's uh, in uh, its order 100 GeV if you were to put uh, uh, scales uh, or even be beyond. Now, um, they also match non perturbativity to another scheme in order to test perturbation theory and they, they can then do various consistency checks. And uh, what they find is that unfortunately these gradient flow couplings themselves are rather slow to reach asymptotic uh, values. Um, but if, if, if they match to the other scheme, the Schrodinger functional schemes, then this uh, asymptotic region is reached much earlier. And obviously the, 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 the flag criteria are matched in all cases. Uh, there was also another consistency check done by Alberto Amos and Alessandro Nada, which I maybe don't need to discuss uh, in detail now um, without all the definitions at hand. But uh, just to give you an impression, here is uh, the kind of plot where you plot the lambda parameter, uh, the estimates for the lambda parameter versus the parametric uncertainty, which in these cases is alpha squared. Uh, so I remind you um, some pages back, if I may go back here. Uh, this, at the bottom of this page, the parametric uncertainty when evaluating this number parameter to um, uh, is alpha to the loop, loop number. And uh, so, um, and L means that B, uh, so if this is two, then B3 is known, and that's the three loop uh, beta function is known. 
Okay, so here it's plotted versus alpha squared, which is this, sorry, this is a wrong plot here, versus alpha squared. And, and then you see that uh, the points, uh, the red po uh, points, they line nicely up uh, if you extrapolate to the, um, to the uh, zero coupling, then you find that everything becomes consistent. But even at the highest couplings reached by the simulations, uh, some of these points are still uh, one sigma or so away from this uh, gray band, which is the, um, the uh, final result by Dalabrida Ramos, they quote. Okay, so this is a nice uh, demonstration of, of, of how this can actually be controlled and how difficult it can be, because normally you would just sit at a very uh, short window in, in, in alpha squared and uh, only have a few points and they scatter and uh, you would have to give an error that basically covers the whole um, uh, um, area here. And, and that's, that's it's very hard to, 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 um, to pin down this asymptotic uh, um, behavior here. Anyway, okay, uh, there's an actually- sorry, Stefan, I'm sorry yes? to interrupt. We are running a bit out of time. Uh, yes. Uh, so we are I see, I see. Okay, time maybe I, I didn't quite record when I started. I can uh, I can finish. I'm almost finished actually. Okay. Uh, I wanted Good. To, um, thank you. Yes, please. Thank just you, thank say you. here. Um, this is actually a demonstration uh, in also at zero flavors by Husung et al, where they do the static energy and they do a very um, nice theoretical analysis, but they conclude that they cannot pin down uh, lambda ms bar to better than five percent. Even they go to lattice size up to 192 uh, to the four, uh, which is very large lattices and very fine lattice spaces of 0.01 uh, Fermi. Uh, so so uh, this actually demonstrates nicely the difficulty of, of this problem and uh, makes one appreciate these kinds of, of studies where we can actually go to these asymptotic behavior. So here's a summary of the uh, plot for all the uh, um, lambda, uh, lambda three and lambda zero. There is actually now some tension for lambda zero um, uh, because there are a lot of old results uh, from 20 years ago where certain effects were basically underestimated by some uh, collaborations, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, I think without changing the criteria, we just had to enlarge the range such that it would cover the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, res the results entering it. And that meant essentially doubling the error from compared to, um, to to a flag uh, 2019. Okay, um, conclusions. I have, I think, mentioned a lot of uh, this already. So let me just say that um, uh, yeah, let me just point to these um, uh, talks that will follow that will basically uh, document the progress since the deadline of flag 2021. Uh, there will be talks by Johannes Weber, Nora Bambilla, Alberto Ramos, and Matilda Laprida, essentially, uh, who will talk about various things touched upon by me. Thank you very much for the attention. Very comprehensive presentation. Do we have questions uh, from the audience or from Zoom? Uh, So David, you want to ask? Uh, yes, I can ask. I can start there, Nora and Klaus. So maybe Klaus and Nora first, I'll go last. Okay, so um, can you go back to the determination of the static energy that you were uh, showing uh, before, uh, that, uh, where you see? Uh, 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 who's on it, all the zero flavor? Yeah, last thing that, yeah, I came late to your talk, I'm uh, terribly sorry. This one, yeah. So can you exp exp uh, explain to me a little bit uh, more why one cannot nail down up to better than 5%, so you are going to uh, which distance, 0 0.0.1 0 .0 Fermi. So for yeah, you- no, this is yeah, this is uh, this was a conclusion by the authors. Uh, I think uh, it's not my conclusion here, but uh, yeah. So so basically, um, so what they do is they use the Wilson action uh, because they want to avoid any unitarity problems, uh, which means they have a transfer matrix, and uh, for the ground state extraction by a um, it, it's 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 uh, it's very nice to have unitary uh, to to have no unitarity violations by 
uh, states close to the cutoff if you add any improvement terms. But that, of course, also means that the cutoff effects are larger. Uh, so they, they, they have to pay a price for that. And um, so they have the nine th uh, nice theoretical features. Um, it's also open boundary conditions are used uh, um, in order to avoid topology freezing. Okay, so topology can change in these simulations, even though the lattice is extremely fine. If you had periodic boundary conditions, this, this would totally be stuck in, in fixed topology. Um, they also do some step scaling in infinite volume. The thing I mentioned that should be done maybe or attempted by, by other collaborations also for other quantities. Uh, um, uh, and they, so they, they, um, they try to compare with the beta function there. Uh, they have done, there's a nice work by a thesis by Nikolai Husong to have, uh, to study the behavior of lattice artifacts, not just the powers in, in the lattice spacing, but also the uh, subleading uh, powers of alpha, which can be um, in this asymptotic free uh, theory can be directly pinned down the, the powers of these alphas that come with it. And uh, this is a very nice work and they, can, they, they, they actually know uh, the leading powers uh, asymptotically of, of the A squared effects. And uh, despite all these nice uh, theoretical features, um, they, they say they cannot distinguish. You see here these two uh, um, at the um, these two points are um, Dalla Brida uh, and Ramos, the one I mentioned, and uh, well, I think this one here, and uh, and and this is the another result by Kita Zawait al the flow QCD, which claims a very small error, but this is a very naive error estimate, I would say. Uh, so this is this tension I was talking about in the literature between different determinations in the field, and they cannot really distinguish if these are really the arrow bars. That's but they calculate the static energy. You were saying that they calculate the static energy. Do I correctly understand that? I think it's the force here, no? Well, whatever Th that thing, uh, with a normal or not, uh, they don't think that they calculate the force directly. But it, it's a static force, yeah, and and it may also be. I mean, I, I'm not uh, sure. Loop for uh, loop, uh, I don't. Which I said before, in, in, in zero flavor, uh, sometimes things can get more difficult. Uh, an example would be the asymptotics of this uh, in this plot here, where you even at these extremely high energies, uh, you're still not really there uh, in some cases. So it might be that this is also a problem in, in this quantity that it's actually more difficult uh, in zero flavors than in, in, in QCD. But, but uh, it's a nice uh, test case here and with uh, um, uh, maybe very conservative errors, I would say, uh, in, and, and then they, they come, to, come to this conclusion here. My, my point is that what- so Nora, you... sorry. I'm sorry to cut the discussion, but some speakers also have constraints. So we should really try to keep- uh... yeah, Sure, sure, sure. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh... But I think we should really move on now. I'm, I'm very sorry about this. I don't know, were there other questions? David, did you have a quick question, but- uh... Yeah, I wanted to know what is the, I mean, uh, the goal of the workshop is to know where, where we will be in, in 10 years from now, if you can forecast it. So what is your feeling of uh, what the uh, ultimate uncertainty from the lattice will be in 10 years from now? Is it driven by, by what exactly? Yeah, um, okay, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, well, the, 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 if you look at the steps, here is the uh, plot. Um, you see the step scaling result here for alpha 17 is still somewhat dominated by statistics. Uh, so it could, it could be pushed a bit further. Um, and uh, also, uh, and then there's this discup the decoupling method that we will hear about a lot in the afternoon. I have to refer you to that. And, and there is a real potential, I think, to, to still get the error to half a percent or so. Uh, slightly better than half a percent, I would estimate. Uh, 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 then you must also worry at some point about um, um, isospin uh, uh, violations, perhaps at some point, and and uh, either to mass due to mass differences uh, uh, or to to electromagnetic effects. Electromagnetic effects might not be negligible if you get to much less than half a percent error in alpha. So then one has to uh, work harder even. May I just Thank you. add my little question here because it's on this slide actually. Go ahead, Klaus. Okay, so you're, you're saying on the summary slide that this is a conservative estimate of the, answer, on, of the uncertainty uh, and you're taking only the one from the alpha 17. 
So why is it conservative to just take this as the uncertainty and not taking into account the variation of the other points that are entering, although the uncertainties are, are um, systematic? Yeah, these gray bands are basically our range for, for, for these particular determinations that we uh, um, estimated as a conservative estimate of, of systematics that might affect these. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and you, you have seen that, that in, um, in uh, this case here, there was this result is by Nora, I think, Tom Pusidi, Nora and collaborators, and this one is the same data um, but differently evaluated. Uh, this is this step scaling function result is really the, the systematic error is still much smaller than the statistical error. This is really uh, um, uh, it's not on the same footing. You really can go to a hundred GeV here, and uh, um, so. But still, if you would average these and, and take the errors in quadrature, you would get a much smaller error than we have given. Yeah, so we are conservative in that sense that if you took these ranges and uh, and 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 uh, added in quadrature, you would get an error that is actually smaller, significantly smaller than than what is given. So what we chose to do is instead to use the one which is statistics dominated as the error of, as a proxy for the global error. Thank you. I really think we should move now to the next talk. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, I stop sharing. Thank yeah. You. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry for going over time. Okay, so the next peak, I believe, is um, Johannes Viga. Can you mute him? Uh, so you can see my slides? Yes, uh, wonderful. Please go ahead. Oh. Thank you. Okay, then I first like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present this work that was done with together with Peter Kutretsky and was published in 2019 for the first analysis and then for a reanalysis just one week ago, it appeared on EPJC. And let me just sort of jump immediately into it. So I'll uh, sort of start with a brief introduction to, to for our view on this topic of the Kokoni moments and alpha S extraction. Then I discuss the technical details and come to a summary at the end. Um, and that was too fast, sorry. Uh, so if you look at Kokoni correlators, computer or lattice, um, we can look at various results that have been published put forward by various groups. So the PW19 is our old result here from 2019 that you find over here with a very large error bar. You have the HP2CD 2014 result, which is a full flavor analysis, which has non-overlapping error bars here, but it's full flavor. And you have this reanalysis of Boito and Matteo of the subset of the data here in the PW19 result, and it's much, much higher. That tells you that something with the Coconia moments seems to be a little bit problematic for the alpha S extraction. If you take a closer look into a uh, detailed look or average of different results in this category that we had been doing here with Jawad Kumjani and Peter uh, a few two years ago, and we look at the Coconia moments section, you have four different determinations out of this 2019 work here at four different values of the charm mass, and while the one K times the char mass and one and a half times the char mass heavy quote mass results. And reason agreement we get then for the larger masses results that are completely off. And in the case of two MC, they come with an error that is much too small to sort of account for this behavior. And so we decided later on that these results that were used in the average over here should not be used because the continuum results that we had there are for whatever reason not to be trusted that we try to investigate further, which we did in our last work. And um, so what I want to discuss is why these results had underestimated uncertainties, how we managed to fix this, and what this means now for the lattice summary, summary of the alpha S determinations from the Kukonium moments. So I begin, what we heard from Stefan again is the idea is we have to compute hydronic observables on the lattice if these depend on some intrinsic scale mu that is sufficiently high that the recoupling approach is applicable for a perturbative calculation of this quantity, we can compare to perturbation theory and obtain alpha s at the scale mu from that. On the lattice, we have a window problem. The hydronic quantities the demand that we sort of can reasonably resolve lambda QCD, then we have the higher scale nu at some point, and then the inverse lattice spacing one over A, and these should be well separated ideally, but this is hard to realize in practice. And what we sort of have to do is we have to go to some compromises for this. 
One way how we deal with this in the continuum with the ordering of lambda QCD and our high scalars, we can use operator project expansion and then separate the contributions suppressed by powers of lambda over the hard scale out. And this does not critically depend on the continuum limits and principle. The idea of the OPE also works at finite lattice spacing. And we look at the time moments of pseudo scalar Krokonian correlators. This work was started in 2008 and is still ongoing for various groups. So the idea is that the heavy port mass MH is our scale. We can vary the heavy port mass. We can make it larger than the charm mass on the lattice and therefore reduce some of the problem that we have with using perturbations here at the charm scale. It's comparable to some rules in many regards that are used with experimental data where Diogo, uh, Boito and Matteo work together on it. And here for the lattice, our problem is that we have large port mass discretization errors of type AMH to some powers or logarithms of AMH. And this means that the simulations are quite demanding and that it's very challenging to get a precise and reliable continuum limit. So this was started initially with phenomenological work by the Karlsruhe group here that extracted results from the experimental data on the RS ratio. And Boito et al. used this also recently where they also use lattice data. And then in 2008, HPQCD collaboration started really doing a lattice extraction starting with three flavor simulation using highly improved staggered quarks. And um, this then sort of went on. Here you have in blue the JLQCD results which use domain wall fermions. And finally then from the hot QCD lattice side, Protetsky et al. with three C4 flavors or we sort of just put our last publication a week ago. And there is a full flavor calculation still ongoing by Milk and Fermilab uh, that needs to be just sort of analyzed, which takes a lot of time. Okay, so our setup in the three flavor calculations, we use two sets of gauge ensembles. The upper ones here have been generated by hot QCD collaboration. They have a pi n mass in the continuum limit of 160 MeV, so it's almost physical. And they have a wide range of lattice spacing, so the variation of the lattice scale is something like a factor two and a half. And there is reasonably large volumes and fairly small volumes. And the charm port mass in this case has been determined by looking at the spin average of the eta C and the J sign. We have a second set of gauge ensembles that have been generated by Badaoff and I, also for finite temperature QCD for a study of the QCD equation of state. These lattices tend to have, in the cases where they have the same lattice spacing, also the same volume, but they reach to much finer lattice spacings and then much, much smaller physical volumes. And they also have a pi n mass that is a factor too larger than these lattices up there. What we then use, since we have only charm and light quark, uh, it says strange and light quarks in the sea, we have partially quenched heavy quarks. We use in this valence sector the highly improved second quark action, simulate with uh, uh, valence charm and bottom quarks with different values of the mass from one time the charm mass to four times the charm mass, and also at the bottom quark mass. We compute a pseudo scalar meson correlation function and use a renormalization group. Uh, invariant correlator, which is multiplied here by two poles of the light port mass. We staggered this does not re require further renormalization. This correlator has a divergence as one of the t to the fourth if you go to small times. So if you multiply this by powers of the time in units of the lattice spacing, then starting from the fourth power, you get finite quantities, and these finite quantities can be compared to a perturbative calculation. In these gauge ensembles, what we found is the statistical errors that our results for these moments have are smaller than the values that we get from finite volume and also smaller than the errors that we get from a finite error of tuning the charm quark mass from the correlators. Um, and C quark mass effects for the two ensembles where we have two different light quark masses of C are on the level of the statistical error, so they do not matter. And therefore, we combine these two sets of gauge ensembles in a combined analysis. Then we can fit our correlation function that we compute on the lattice with the finite length of the time extent and use our fit with a fit function to extract the ground state and the first excited state to extrapolate to larger value of NT to account for the finite time effects that we have in our lattice correlators. This is also a standard procedure that we have not invented. It has been done by HPQCD in the past, and this is the only thing that makes sense in our view. We use random color wall sources compared to the older calculation 
by Mezawa and Kretzky, and that shrinks our statistic varies by about one order of magnitude compared to this older calculation, which is the reason why we can get more precise results for the moments as well in file fast. Um, we look at ratios of the moments that can be defined in this way, where we have one moment with n, one moment which is two orders higher, and if you take these ratios, you should see some cancellation of the statistical fluctuations and of the quote mass dependence in these correlators because they both or these male moments because they're both based on the same statistic, same correlator. Then we use something that is called tree level reduced moments, where you divide the QCD moments by the moment that you get in the free theory, non-interacting theory. And that means that lattice artifacts, which are not multiplied by some non-trivial power of the, of the gauge coupling, must exactly cancel out in these quantities. And so the coefficients of our lattice artifacts that we have must be now accompanied by non-trivial powers of the lattice spacing. And these non-trivial power of the gauge coupling and these non-trivial powers of gauge coupling, if the gauge coupling is a function of the lattice spacing, imply that we face a logarithmic lattice spacing dependent that is very hard to treat. We also then can consider different moments and different masses. We find that generally the lattice artifacts are worse for smaller moments, when the, for lower moments, when you are more sensitive to short time physics, you're sensitive to the lattice artifacts, they're worse for larger masses. So if you look at different masses, we get an idea about the different systematic contributions from lattice artifacts and from other effects, which will lead to very different error budgets for different masses. We have finite size effects due to finite time and also finite uh, size effects due to different volume. And what we find is that the intuitively, clearly that the free theory moments, G0, zero, a GN0, must be more sensitive to finite size effects than the QCD moments, because in these uh, moments in the free theory, we essentially have only fictitious quark anti quark scattering states in the spectrum, while in the QCD moments, we have mesons in the low energy states which are less sensitive to finite side effects. So what we can do in order to estimate the finite side effects is that we compute the free and the free theory moments with different volumes and extrapolate to infinite volume and then look at the correction that we get and assume that the QCD correction is much smaller than this and assume that they would point in the same direction such that the free theory contribution for the finite size effects is sufficient. And then we have to deal with expansion that accounts for the three scales, the lambda QCD, the heavy quark mass, and the inverse lattice spacing. And in the reality, unfortunately, they're not that clearly separated as we would like to have it. So what we do is we then compute the force moment and the higher moments uh, that we have there in the form of reduced moments, and we extrapolate them to the continuum limit in such a form that we have the continuum contribution plus then a double sum, the first sum, in the powers of the boosted lattice gauge coupling, which we take only as integer powers in this case, then we have an extra contribution where we potentially account for logarithms in A times the bare heavy quark mass that cannot be accounted for in this because the boosted lattice coupling doesn't know anything about the partially quenched heavy quark, and then powers of the heavy quark mass times the lattice spacing to even powers, which is the only form that can occur with staggered quarks. And if we look at the older analysis that we had in 2019, we had these red data here. At the finest lattices, you can sort of do the most simple expansion with only very few terms, just sort of the first power in alpha and the first power in the AMH naught correction. But as you include more and more terms, you need to also more and more data at larger values of AMH naught you have to include more and more terms in order to account for this. And this separate extrapolation to the continuum limit worked well for the smallest quark masses, but it started to produce problems once we went to larger quark masses because we lost data here at the small AMH naught end and got gained data at this end, but the discretization effect that are apparent in these data here seem to become actually less pronounced as you go to larger quark mass, which is absolutely counterintuitive and is a clear sign that these logs matter. In the new edition that we just got out one week ago, we um, did a joint fit of the data with all five quark mass that you see here. So heavy quark mass from the charm mass with one and a half, two, three, and four times the charm mass with this unsearch, which very, very strictly assumes that the coefficients that you have here in this polynomial 
are shared between the different values of the heavy quark mass, but the continuum limit for each heavy quark mass is an independent parameter. And once you do this, you can fit all of the lattice or all of the heavy quark mass results very well. You need more parameters as a sum as you permit a larger value of the heavy quark mass, but the continuum results do not very strictly depend on where you put the cut. It's just sort of a different number of terms that you actually require. And we use for our main analysis, we set these logarithmic terms here to zero and just use the one here. If we included those terms, we generally needed fewer coefficients in these two sums, but the continuum result did not change in a systematic way and had smaller errors than what we got within the expansion where we ignored these terms and just used higher order terms in these three expansions. That's why we stuck with these results for the continuum limit without the logs in the end. When we look at the results of your obtain here, you see here in dark green, the old analysis for R4 at the char mass, the new result here, it's completely in agreement. You see an old result by Mazawa and Petretsky down here, which underestimated the R4 value by an over, due to an oversimplified continuum extrapolation that could not be resolved because they had two large statistical errors. The results here for R4 are also statistically in agreement with older calculations by HBQCD with three flavors either in 2010 or in 2008, but the results in the present analysis have small errors. If we look at the ratio of R6 over R8, then we have again a problem with Mazawa Petretsky 2016, which is again due to oversimplified continuum extrapolation, but we have perfect agreement between the results from 2019 and 2022 in the, uh, at, the, at the charm mass. However, the errors went down again. With the HPQCD results here, we have a problem to really get realistic errors because they do not give a continuum result for these ratios explicitly, even though so the errors for R6 and R8 are highly correlated probably. So what we can do is we can assume that they're perfectly correlated or totally anti-correlated. And that gives these two different kinds of error bands for these results. They seem to be systematically higher, but I'll uh, just sort of point out that these are difficult to compute because if you have very few data, it's very hard to get the logarithmic dependence right that you have with these results. So if we look at larger quark masses than 1.5 MC, what we find is that R6 over R8 cannot be computed reliably unless we input using the results from R4, the continuum value for R6 over R8 at two times MC, and then we can extrapolate the results uh, at finite lattice space and together with the results at smaller quark masses and everything comes out consistently. R4 and R8 over R10 for the larger quark masses have seen significant changes since the 2019 edition because of the joint continuum extrapolation which brought these into fair agreement with the results at smaller quark masses. And we realized also in the 2022 analysis that for the charm mass and the ratio R8 over R10 we cannot obtain a reliable continuum result because we have severe finite volume effects in this case and have to exclude most of the data that we took at the charm point. However, for all of the larger quark masses, we don't have any problem and get results that are in nice agreement to what we have for R4 at the same masses or lower masses, albeit with larger areas such that it's not useful for pinning down alpha s any further. So how do we get alpha s out of this? We compare the lattice data to the recoupling result that's sort of sketched here. The reduced moments are known in perturbation theory in terms of a polynomial in alpha with a coefficient that depends on the log of the scale in the coupling divided by the heavy quark mass. And the heavy quark mass, again, depends on a scale. It is sort of intuitive and natural to choose these two together and being the same. But what was found by Boito and Matteo was that varying the scale new is absolutely necessary in order to get realistic estimates of the uncertainty. We have not done this in 2019, but in the new analysis, we included this, and this indeed proved important for getting realistic error estimates. We then have a finite series here, only up to third order in alpha. So we estimate a missing higher order contribution by estimating the coefficient of an alpha s to the four term as plus or minus five times the last known coefficient and included this in order to get a perturbative error estimate. Furthermore, 
in this continuum expression that we have here, non perturbative physics must enter in the OPE. The first term in the OPE that dominates are the QCD condensates or the gluon condensate. We take that value from tau decays, it's given here, and it's suppressed by four powers of the heavy quark mass. And therefore, as you go to a larger quark mass in the lattice calculation, the uncertainty from not knowing this condensate particularly well, we varied it within a factor of two in order to get an estimate of the error here. Um, then also decreases very much by going to larger quark mass. And so that's where we are now. We have continuum results for the moment are four at five values of the heavy quark mass. And then we can fit these results with a perturbative form to extract alpha s at a scale nu, where nu is some multiple of the heavy quark mass that we use in the calculation. Now, since we have five different masses to start from in the lattice calculation, we can choose different multiples here between mu divided by mh in order to get different results for the lattice spacing so for for the for the gauge coupling at the scale so here you see our continuum results for r4 here you see if you go to alpha s at the charm scale you get these numbers the first error here is the error of the lattice result from continuum extrapolation that includes everything like finite volume errors, quark mass, mistuning, etc. The second error comes from perturbation theory from the truncation, which we estimated by adding the higher order term. And the third error comes from the gluon condensate contribution. So what you see is, as we increase the quark mass in the lattice calculation, you see that on the one hand, the error on the lattice side goes up, but the error on the perturbative side and the condensate side goes down. So the results that we get from these different calculations have a very, very different composition of the error budget, even so it's computed in the same way. And so we can now compare the alpha s at some low energy scale, that is some factor times the quark mass, with the result that we got from another combination. If you look here at, for example, the point at two or at three or at four or six times the charm mass, we get contributions from different combinations of the lattice quark mass and this factor of the scale. And all of these are completely in agreement with an errors, which tells us that we seem to have a realistic estimate of the uncertainties on this side. We can go a little bit further and then sort of compute the charm mass and the running of the charm mass. So what we do here is we now take our alpha s, determine at the scale new that we got from R4, and the bare mass that we have in the lattice simulation and the result of this higher moment Rn with n being 6, 8, or 10, and combine these to obtain the heavy quark mass, we normalize in MS bar at the scale nu. And when we have somewhat correlated errors due to the condensate that contributes in both of the moments, we also have uh, uh, perturbative errors both in the expression for R6 and in the expression that sort of led in R4 to the obtained alpha S, et cetera. So we all propagate these errors. In principle, statistical errors would be correlated between the lattice data, but they are so small that they do not matter quantitatively. So what we then find is a very nice running of the charm mass from about one to about 10 GV. We get something at new divided by MH3 that is about two sigma lower than the results that we get at the other scales which might hint at a somewhat underestimated truncation error in presumably the higher moments, but this does not matter at the level of the total error budget for analysis to obtain the lambda parameter. Once we have alpha s of nu and the charm mass at the scale nu, we can then sort of use perturbative running by the runback package to obtain the lambda parameter in NS3. And this is what is shown down in this table. So you read it again, different rows, use different input quark mass on the lattice side, and the different columns here use a different ratio of the scale over the heavy quark mass that we used. What you generally observe is, as we go from, to, from a smaller quark mass on the lattice to a larger quark mass on the lattice, the lambda parameter that we get increases. What you also see is that if we go to, from a smaller new divided by MH to a larger one, that the lambda parameter that we get increases. However, if we look at where the error budget in total seems to be most in favor of the result, that typically is at nu over mh being close to one and at lighter masses of the charm quark. So it's not just that it's a completely fair comparison between all these results. If you look at the errors, it's highly skewed 
into this corner of this table. So in order to get a fair estimate, we can take something that is somewhere in the middle of this table, which we pick as the most typical would be something like MH is one and a half or two MC, and nu over MH would be one and a half or two. And these would lead us to here something like 326 or 330 MeV for the lambda parameter. On the other hand, we can try to propagate everything, all of the errors correctly and perform an unweighted average or a weighted average of all of these results. This leads to more or less the same result, which is about 331 to 332 MeV for the lambda parameter. So this is the plot where you see the data from this table. So the color gives you the quark mass on the lattice side, while here the x-axis gives you the ratio of the scale over the heavy quark mass that we use. So you see this trend as we go to the right in terms of larger masses and lattice simulation, the preferred lambda goes up. If you go to the right in terms of the ratio of the scale over the heavy quark mass, you see the similar trend. And what we did in the end is we took the unweighted average and then enlarged the error bar that we got from the average by naively propagating the error to the point that all of the primary results that we got are included in the uncertainty band because we do not think that a smaller error for the lambda parameter would be realistic. Then we have an error of two from the lattice scale here. And then once we use Rundeck to propagate this to the Z pole, we obtain an alpha S of 0.1177 with an error of 12 in the last two digits. And the error due to the running contributes just a very minor contribution that doesn't really change anything substantially here. And so what happened is now that the old results in 2019 are now superseded by this new result of this joint analysis, which is in perfect agreement with all of the older results from the Kukoni moment. So here's three flavor HPQCD, four flavor HPQCD, JLQCD, and we get this error bar, bar here essentially mainly since we did the scale variation from two thirds of, from two thirds to a factor three in the heavy quark mass for the scale in the continuum analysis. Now, HPQCD that claimed this very small error bar here did not do this. They just used a factor three here. And if we use just a factor three at the charm mass, we get absolutely the same central values HPQCD did. So we are in perfect agreement with this, but we're not in agreement with the error that one should assign to this result. And then we can compute now from this, these four points, the sub-average from the moments, we either get a 0.1182 with an uncertainty of five, if we believe the uncertainty of the HPQCD results. If we do not believe that this is a realistic measure of the uncertainty, but believe that the uncertainty cannot be realistically smaller than what we got, it would be 0.1180 with an error of seven. Again, as Stefan mentioned earlier, can we trust the shrinkage of the error from lattice calculations when they're dominated by the truncation error of perturbation theory or other systematics? We don't recommend that. So just to briefly close this, we can determine the quark masses from the moments for the charm mass, for the bottom mass, they're in perfect agreement with all of the other lattice determinations and have smaller errors than experimental determinations that have the quark masses but we couldn't add anything new in the last analysis because it's dominated by the scale error in our case. And that brings me to the summary. So once we use this new result, instead of the old Pruchetsky weber result from 2019, everything with the moment seems to be sorted out, except that we have the problem that the HPQCD error bars appear to be underestimated. And therefore I think with the moments, unless we get more precise, or if, if we, unless we get a next to next to an N4 alone result for the moments, we are not going to be able to improve the alpha asset coming from the moment any further. But on the lattice side, I think there is nothing more to add at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this very clear presentation. We are again a bit tight with time, but if there are questions. Sir? Other questions here from the audience? Or from, uh, yes, sir? Let's see. I'm not sure. So, Johannes, can you hear me? 
Yes. So um, since many of your tables were in green, I couldn't read the numbers. So I also couldn't read the, the errors. The quick question is, suppose that you did not know the gluon condensate at all. You had no clue whatsoever. Uh, my impression is that it would not influence your final error analysis. Is that, is that right? Uh, yes, essentially it has no impact on the final error. So we vary the gluon condensate within a factor of two, but for the three largest masses that we have, the, the, the gluon condensate error contribution does not appear in the error budget because it's zero at the digits where we consider the errors. And so whether that changes a little bit does not matter at all. Okay, thank you. Do you have other questions? Okay, now from Zoom. I have a quick question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Johannes, uh, I just wanted to understand, um, in your final result, can you separate the composition of the error? Because you have, we have um, a very good breakdown of the error from the different scales, so. So, so we be very, so we always kept the scale of the mass and the scale of the coupling the same. That is one thing that we did different from you, but we sort of have this sort of scale very, in, in this table, you essentially see the different contents. The first error comes from the continue from the lattice side, the second error comes from the perturbation theory, higher order contributions, and the third error comes from the condensate. And so what you always see that the condensate error is in all cases subleading. That doesn't matter at all. If you change the condensate by a factor two, that does essentially nothing. And for the small masses, so the charm mass and the uh, one and a half times the charm mass, the perturbative error is dominant. And if you go to higher masses, the error of the lattice from the continuum extrapolation becomes dominant. And yeah. therefore, that, that you might be able to improve, but it would be very, very high. And I think it still sort of will come down that when you sort of do the full error estimate and try to be, be honest, you will have to include that the perturbative truncation error will have a big impact on the smaller values of the heavy quark mass. And if you include that in the error budget, you will still end up with a large error, even if you have very good data at two or three MC. No, but my question is in the final number that you gave with the 0012 uncertainty, in the 0012, <laughs> do you know how much is perturbation theory there? Um, almost everything. I mean, if you look at the sort of lambda QCD here, or the lambda NF3 that we have here, you see that if you would just naively, proper, naively compute an average, you would get an error of something like 12 for lambda. And we enlarge this error in order to account for, and in this case, even so it's dominantly perturbation theory truncation error that gives you the 12. And then we enlarge this error to 17 in order to account for still not believing that our truncation error is sufficiently conservative. Just, just a very quick thing that is related to that. So you always do the scale variation at alpha s to the third, right? The alpha s to the fourth is used, used independently, right? Right, the alpha s to the fourth is used when we sort of extract alpha s of nu and the quark mass of nu. And then after that, I mean, we get, we get do the running, which we do with five flu beta function and explicit versus implicit scheme and everything. But the higher order term is only included when we sort of extract from the primary lattice data. Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe we should uh, thank you again. And we move now to the next uh, presentation by Nora. Thank you very much. Okay, do you see it? Let me move. Can we full screen? Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Nora, then. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I... I move the, okay. Okay, so thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here and uh, tell you about uh, alpha S strata from the QCD static energy and the QCD static force. So the QCD static energy is a key object. It has been calculated since the beginning of QCD. It is an observable up to an additive uh, co constant. And it is very well known in perturbation theory. Using effective field theory, potential artistic QCD, we can obtain it at three loops uh, with nest to nest to nest leading log accuracy. It is now calculated with high precision on the lattice with uh, two plus one and two plus one plus one flavors. So it is a natural. To compare the lattice uh, uh, determination of the static energy and the perturbative calculation to a strata alpha S. 
The challenge, the challenge as we will see, are in order to get a more and more precise extraction of alpha S, are to go to very short heavy quark and deep quark distances on the lattice. And uh, I will present here a new idea that is uh, to use finite temperature lattice data on the free energy to reach that. And then there is the issue to deal with the renormal on, uh, that is canceling between the residual mass and the potential. And the idea logic to study uh, then uh, the problem is the force, because the force is renormal on free. And so I will present a new idea about calculate the force, defining an object that defines the force directly of the lattice, so that one can then equate this lattice determination to the perturbative expansion and the strata alpha S. So here a bit of bibliography uh, for the static energy. We start calculating it uh, a long time ago from 2007. In, um, in 2010, we extract uh, the, the R0 times lambda ms from uh, uh, the sequential data, and then we get an extraction into four, uh, 2012, 2014, and the new updated extraction in 2019, as it will be presented in all its detail by the next talk. I will, I will uh, present it here in main feature, but all the details will be given in the next talk by Johannes Peter. And then there is this new uh, idea about the force that is uh, dating back to work again uh, of 20 years ago, and the proposal uh, of, um, I don't manage to remove this. Sorry, I have something that is appearing in my screen. Uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, this uh, article of Antonio Vairo. And then uh, recently we started uh, calculating it uh, on the lattice uh, using first quenched lattice. So, as I told you, uh, we are looking at the static energy. It is uh, something known in, uh, uh, on the lattice with the Wilson loop and in perturbation theory. So if uh, R times lambda goes to D is much smaller than one, both uh, things uh, should agree. So the idea is that uh, lambda goes to D can be uh, fixed from a low energy observable calculated on the lattice. And then we can calculate this uh, static energy perturbatively in the standard MS bar scheme. And then we can get lambda. Um, MS bar by equating the lattice and the perturbative expression. And since this is a physical quantity, there is no uh, need to change from lattice to MS bar renormalization scheme. So alpha is extracted in this way, give one of the most precise determination at low energy scale. And it is uh, competitive, as I will show you. And it is uh, interesting because it is complementary to the high energy determination. And it has also an intrinsic value because it is uh, adding to our understanding of QCD. And then it is uh, constraining the running of alpha S. So uh, let me come to the object, uh, the static energy. Static energy is a function of uh, the quark and the quark distance, uh, R, and it is defined in uh, this way. It is uh, the limit for large T of a static Wilson loop. This, is, uh, uh, this average is the average in QCD. And this object here represents a quark and the quark static created some time T, then time is evolving, large time, and then they are annihilated at subsequent time. This object is contained in this thing, as it is just called the static Wilson loop. So this is the object that is evaluated on the lattice, and the perturbation theory describes the static energy in the short range. And it is given by this expansion. We have the residual mass, and then we have this expansion in alpha s. It is known as free loop. And you see that at free loop, you originate the logarithm of alpha s. And this comes from the cancellation of contribution coming from two different energy scales, the soft and the ultra soft scale. And the point is that uh, the Wilson loop uh, is uh, endowed uh, with uh, several energy scales. Uh, the static limit, we have the source scale, that is uh, one over R, which is bigger than uh, the ultra source scale that I will show to you. It is the difference between the other and the static potential. So you see in this uh, diagram a free loop, uh, that is a famous Apple Kistein uh, uh, diagram. You see that the free loop, you have contribution of this type. And then why here the quark and the quark are propagating in a singlet, here they are propagating in a knotted. The problems that arise calculating this object is if 
you do this calculation, uh, order by order in perturbation theory in a bar, then you get divergent terms from free loop on. Uh, one needs an effective field theory to resum and combine contribution coming from different scales. And then if you do like that, you generate this log of alpha. And uh, the scale, as I told you, are the, the soft scale and uh, this ultra soft scale, which is uh, smaller. And then there is a scale of lambda. Then we need an effective filter in order to factorize the scale. And the effective filter that we are going to use is a potential statistic OCD. And uh, uh, potential statistic OCD I have written here for uh, uh, weekly capital potential statistic OCD. It is written in terms of, uh, these are the light degrees of freedom that are not changing. These are quark anti quark in a singlet, and these are quark anti quark in a knotted. And uh, uh, this is a propagator of the singlet, and this is a propagator of uh, the octet. At the next to leading order in the multiple expansion, so when we expand the uh, gluon field in the quark anti quark distance, you get the mixing between the octet and the singlet, and these are the vertices that will appear in the theory. So there is a well, uh, well defined way to construct this theory, and the potential in particular are the matching coefficient of uh, the fetish theory. They are calculating by a standard matching procedure. So we can look now back to the Wilson loop and analyze it using the Fetty field theory. And this uh, Wilson loop can be written in the Fetty field theory as a propagator of a static singlet, which is this one, plus the correction that is a static singlet and em emitting a very low energy gluon and turning into an octet. So from this, it comes out this relation. So the static energy is equal to residual mass plus the potential, the single static potential that comes from this propagator, plus the correction that is I mean, from this diagram that is written like that. It contains the difference between the octet and the color octet quark antiquark potential, the color singlet quark antiquark potential, static. And here there is a correlator of low energy gluons, ultra soft gluons. And this is calculating QCD. This is the ultra soft contribution. Now we see very well what is happening how we generate this logarithm of alpha S inside the static energy. We have this uh, uh, cancellation between soft and ultra soft scale between the potential and this uh, ultra soft contribution. So in this way. And this is also very useful because in order to calculate the contribution that appear at order a free loop or for loop in the potential, one can just make a one loop calculation in the ultra soft uh, in this correlator. So the point is that we have to calculate all the things that are inside this equation. And this uh, comes in the perturbation theory. So VA is essentially one. Then this chromoelectric field correlator, now it's even known as free loops, but we just need the next to leading form for our scope. And then we need also the static outer potential that is known at free loop. And uh, putting everything together from that expression, we can extract the form of the potential. You see that this is a quark anti quark, a single static potential, and it is written down and nest to nest to nest to nest leading order. So we know it pretty well in perturbation theory. The only thing that we don't know yet is the constant at four loop. The constant at three loop was calculated by this author, and all the other terms have a long history. It, 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 it lasted a lot to do this calculation. The field theory uh, helped a lot in this. And you see that here we have this ultra soft locks uh, that are generated because this is a matching coefficient of effective field theory, so it is uh, depending on the ultra soft cutoff. It's uh, fine, it's a static energy, which is an, a, a physical object is not depending on any cutoff. So this is uh, the static single potential at our present knowledge. And uh, from that, uh, we can get uh, the static energy that is also known next to next to next leading order apart from the constant term at for loop. And then uh, we have also two uh, some locks. I've shown to you that here there are locks appearing, and these locks uh, may be large. And uh, uh, the, the filter allows you to write down some uh, renumeration group. Uh, equation in the ultra soft scale, and we can write down this equation, solve this equation, and then we can get the leading log improvement and the next to leading log improvement. So this is the solution of this equation at this order, and then we have all the ingredients 
And this give us as a static energy and nest to nest to nest leading log. So we know in perturbation theory this object pretty well. Now, the point is how to extract the information. So uh, we know that the perturbative expansion of static single potential in continuum is affected by a renormal ambiguity of order lambda. This ambiguity is not affecting in any way the physical information, which is the slope of the potential. That is the only thing that is uh, uh, impacting on the extraction of alpha s. And uh, uh, we can uh, eliminate uh, this indetermination from the perturbative series. We, we can do it in several ways. We can add, uh, um, we can subtract a constant series uh, in alpha s from this single study potential and reabsorb it in the residual mass as usual. Or um, we find it more convenient to consider the force. The force is a derivative of the static energy of the potential, and it is renormal on free. And uh, then uh, this force uh, calculated in alpha s in one of our air could be directly compared with the lattice. Uh, if we would have a, a direct determination of the force on the lattice, or we can calculate in perturbation theory, the force integrated back uh, and we get the static energy. And this is uh, what we will do in the following for the extraction of alpha s from the static energy. So let me give you a little bit uh, an overview on what we have done. We, within 2010, we got this, uh, this value for our zero times lambda ms bar. I just added this for the discussion that uh, came out with Stefan before. And then um, using two plus one flavor lattice data, we have uh, this extraction in 2012, in 2014, and 2019. You see that these extraction are all compatible, but what we are after is reducing the error. And so we found that uh, the thing that is most impacting in reducing the error is going uh, to lattice data at smaller distance. So that's uh, what is uh, crucial to have a reduction in the error. So in the determination of 2014, we have this beta. And uh, in the determination of 2019, we went to largest beta and much smaller lattice spacing. So this uh, analysis uh, reaches distance as small as 0 0.0237 Fermi. And this full analysis I already uh, mentioned, this one of 2019, will be presented in the next talk with all the details. In particular, uh, pointing also to lattice artifact, discretization errors, all these things will be discussed in depth. Going to smaller distance allow us to reduce the error with respect to previous determination, as you, as you see from the results that I present here. Now, what is the general procedure that we are following when we make this extraction from the static energy? So um, we look at the different beta separately, and we perform fits to the lattice data for the static energy, a different, different order of in perturbation theory. And the parameter of the fit is lambda ms bar. And then we repeat the fit, restricting the range of R, so going to smaller uh, R. And we see when the key square is remaining stable or improving when we go to higher order perturbation theory. So this is telling us that we are indeed in the perturbative regime. And then in order to attach a perturbative error to our result, we uh, typically vary in uh, the very the, the scale in the soft scale. And um, we also, uh, we do it by varying the scale and by adding and subtracting a term that is of the order of magnitude of the next term in the perturbative expansion parametrically that is not considered. And then we take the largest uncertainty. So we have things like that. So you see the key square uh, that should remain uh, constant when you go up with a loop. And this is a setting requirement also on the distance that we are considering because we should be in the perturbative regime. So we are set only some data. And we also monitor what is the extraction of R1. This is the scale of the lattice that we use in this determination, R1 times lambda ms bar. Uh, as it is changing for the free beta, this is a determination of 2014, when we reduce uh, the, um, the windows that we consider for our extraction. We can do the same for the force, but you know, uh, we have to numer numerically reconstruct uh, the force from the lattice data. So we have to um, interpolate them with splines and then make the derivatives, and this introduce a bigger error, but we get compatible result also from the force. Now, a couple of uh, uh, comments is that uh, we have uh, 
the result and next to next to next leading log. And then we are looking uh, at the structure of the perturbative correlation. Here I have plotted the uh, loop correlation. These are uh, the finite free loop, uh, the const uh, constant term, the, the loop correlation with the alpha four factorized. These are the two loop correlation with alpha three factorized. And so on. This is a log that is uh, appearing at the free loop, and this is a log multiplied by alpha s to be compared with the two loop. So we see that uh, this uh, um, log uh, uh, correlation, leading log uh, resummation, has uh, uh, opposite sign to respect to the free loop, and uh, it is not sufficiently big, uh, sufficiently large to be summed to the two loop. So what we are doing is that um, given uh, the structure of the correction, we work at free loop, count the US log resummed, the first resummation with the free loop. So in, uh, and of course, uh, we estimate the pertur perturbative error in uh, many ways, considering uh, the log resummation or not, and so on. Then we look if there are non-perturbative correlations. So we parameterize uh, non-perturbative correlation in time proportional to our uh, cube or uh, square to see if there are some uh, condenses, some non-perturbative correlations that are there at a small distance and would uh, uh, make a problem in our extraction, and we find no sign of that. So uh, as I told uh, you, the, the detail of the extraction will be presented in this talk. And now I want to uh, give you a glimpse of the extraction affinity and the use of the force. So we want to go to very small distance because there we can really extract alpha very precisely. And uh, we got the idea that to go to very small distance, we can use finite temperature data because uh, the point is that uh, it's very difficult to go to finite distance because we have also to keep the volume sufficiently large to sit the pion on that, the propagation of the pion. But if you are considering finite data, you no longer have this problem. Uh, you avoid the infrared problem. And then uh, using finite uh, temperature lattice data, we can reach distance as small as uh, lattice spacing as uh, 0.00848 Fermi, which is very useful. And uh, we compute the single free energy with uh, this aspect uh, ratio and then tau of this order, and the temperature is defined in this way as usual. And uh, as I will show you, well, the object that we are calculating on the lattice is an ultra observable. It is a thermal QCD observable. It is uh, the uh, color singlet free energy of a quark and a quark static pair that is defined like that. Uh, there is a trace here and uh, uh, it is uh, this, this uh, expectation value is to be evaluated in uh, thermal QCD and we have fixed as a Coulomb gauge. Now, if we are going again a distance R times T much smaller than one, we can use uh, weekly couple PNR QCD at finite temperature. We have also constructed an extension of the effective theory that considers the existence uh, of uh, of a QCD medium. And in this case, we can write down that the single static energy is equal to the potential, some ultra source scales that depends on the hierarchy of scales, and some correlations that depend on the ultra source scale and the temperature. Now, in this hierarchy of scale, the next scale is this. So the ultra source correlation we are in, uh, interested in is the usual of order alpha S over R. And, uh, then this delta Fs becomes the delta containing the ultra soft correction that we, I already shown to you, plus some uh, temperature dependent correction that we calculated up to some order, g to the five. And uh, this is the same thing as a t equals zero term. So we, what we did is we got this free energy at short distance and a very short distance. So we were working at uh, R smaller than uh, or comparable to two lattice spacing. Then we compare that with free loop plus the leading log, the same formula that we use for the static energy. And we obtain this extraction for a land MS bar that you see it is compatible with the extraction that I presented before. And you see that we, we really have uh, seen that there are no thermal corrections that are important. There is only a constant uh, correction, uh, linear in T that is uh, just a constant that you subtract, it's not depending on R in the small uh, um, range. So you, we, you can do that. And here is a plot in which uh, uh, 
we see that uh, we can reproduce this uh, single singlet uh, free energy even in a wind of much larger than the one used uh, for the extraction of alpha S using this static energy. Okay, now let me come for the new idea, getting alpha S from the force. So the idea is to define an object that can be directly evaluated on the lattice and give you the force. The object is this, it's just an insertion of an electric field inside the static Wilson loop. If you have shown that this object uh, in the limit of T going to infinity gives uh, the static force, uh, which is really the same thing as the derivative of the static energy. So we have a definition that can be used in operators that can be put on the lattice and calculated. And first, we start with quenched calculation. So the first analysis we did in this paper, and we got uh, uh, three different ensemble uh, with this uh, lattice spacing and this volume. And of course, this is quenched, as I told you. So one problem with the force is that when you have uh, electric fields or chromoelectric chromomagnetic fields on the lattice, then you have um, a very slow convergence to the continuum. This was already observed in uh, several previous lattice paper. And uh, we have also surveyed it in our lattice calculation. We calculate that formula for the force using a Wilson loop or a Polyakov loop. Instead of a Wilson loop, you can, uh, you can put a Polyakov loop in the free ensemble. And we see that in order to speed up the convergence to the continuum, one should uh, um, define a kind of emission constant that we define like that. We have this uh, uh, force that we uh, obtain making the derivative of static Wilson loop and the force that we obtain calculating that operator. And we see that this ratio is constant in a uh, some plateau. And uh, here there are the result. So it is kind of a constant renormalization that we can use in order to get the result for the force from this kind of evaluation. And so if we apply that uh, kind of Z, um, we see that uh, here we have the result with the Wilson loop, with the Polyakov loop. They are on the same curve, and the curve agree with uh, uh, this object here that is calculated from the Wilson loop, from the derivative of the potential that is obtained in the Wilson loop. And uh, um, so this is a proof of concept that the thing is working. Both the derivative of the potential and the direct force agree, both the Wilson loop and the Polyakov loop agree. And then one can improve on that. The first thing is that uh, um, we are thinking that we can do better um, because uh, this uh, determination we have used multi-level on the Polyakov and we have used mirroring up, up as mirroring on the Wilson. But I mean, there is this very slow conversion. We have to introduce this uh, constant. We can do better. We can go to gradient flow. So we can smear our fields, as that's the usual procedure of gradient flow introduced by Lucian and Lucian Weitz. So uh, we flow our fields, uh, introducing this uh, T, in this case, T is a flow time, uh, and not just that it is a square in the energy dimensionally. So we uh, do our calculations, substituting our field, our Gulonic field with this flow field. And the first thing that we did was to calculate uh, the force in continuum using gradient flow. And uh, this expression at one loop, first of the potential in continuum, and you see that we get a smearing effect here, is this exponential of minus two plus square t. And uh, you see that this, uh, we see already in the, the continuum that this will improve and facilitate and uh, make faster the convergence to continuum. And uh, we, we have done this calculation and the, um, from that, we can get the force in a continuum in Mrs. Bar scheme, uh, next to leading order calculation in gradient flow. And this uh, thing here, and analytically known, we have calculated them and have this kind of behavior. So uh, you see that for large, uh, for a small, uh, at the end, uh, when you use gradient flow, you have to take first the continuum limit and then the, the limit of the TF, the T. To zero. So you see that this is going to one. And also this, uh, uh, this other function has the correct behavior. This is a dependence on renormalization. And we see the renormalization appropriate is a combination of R plus the gradient flow scale. 
Then we did the, uh, we, I have a preliminary data for the lattice calculation. This is, we, are, we use the same setup that we used for the calculation of the force with the wilson loop and the polyacu loop that I presented you before. And uh, uh, the nice thing that you see is that the gradient flow is really working. This is uh, this uh, Z um, rotation constant that I have defined before for you that was helping the convergence uh, in the previous structure. And you see, if we are at uh, zero flow time, we get um, the same result that we got before with the multi level, for example, in polyaco loop. But then uh, at final flow time, when a flow, uh, gradient flow is becoming active, you see that this uh, constant is over one, is going to one. Moreover, we have preliminary data, so the gradient flow automatically renormalizes the force at final flow time. We have no need of, uh, for any of this uh, renormalization constant. And uh, we also com can compare the, the force. This is uh, the force calculated from the, from the derivative of the Wilson loop. And these are the calculation. And you see, uh, they, mm, they agree. Uh, and these are results in which we couldn't yet go to the continuum. And we couldn't yet go to the zero flow time limit. But still, they seem to be very encouraging. So this may be a new uh, method to extract alpha S. So I come now to my conclusion. So the computation of the static energy and the force in QCD has seen remarkable progress in recent years, uh, both analytically and numerically. And uh, this resulted in a competitive determination of strong coupling constant alpha S. And the result of our uh, um, 2019 alpha S extraction in comparison also with uh, two other results from the literature will be presented in the next talk by Johannes Weber. For the near future, I see two, uh, two things that uh, um, will be progress. So extraction of alpha S for the lattice static energy with two plus one plus one flavor. And then the extraction of alpha S from the force directly calculated on the lattice. So the information of alpha S is contained in the force. So we could uh, calculate this force or by taking numerically the derivative of the static energy. Uh, but this requires a very high precision, or we can directly uh, evaluate it on the lattice using the new operators that I have shown to you. And the gradient flow seems to be very promising. It seems to be very promising both to calculate this force and to calculate a lot of other objects, including uh, that uh, features uh, chromolytic and chromagnetic insertion in generalized Wilson loop that appears in all relativistic effective field theory. So what we are going to do now is to, uh, to go to the continuum limit and then to use our analytic results that we calculate using gradient flow in uh, continuum CD in order to guide our extrapolation to um, flow time equal to zero. Okay, I finish here. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you. Um, we are getting a little bit late, but let's see if we have huge questions now. We have questions from the audience here or from Zoom. Okay. Or to the next talk then directly. Okay. This is a talk by Johannes Weber. Thank you. Okay. I'm back again. <laughs> so I, I just jump directly into the talk since Nora prepared quite a lot of uh, the uh, introduction and of the foundations. So I'm going to talk about the strong coupling constant determination through Clevy QCD for static energy and free energy. I again thank the organizers for permitting me to give this talk. And um, yeah, this is a slide that you've seen already two talks ago. So the point why I show this again is if we look here at the static energy results, they seem to be, or the average of the static energy results seems to be systematically lower than the rest of the lattice determinations that we have. And so we should look at it again, why are they lower? And why is all of this spread over here between the Ayala 20 determination that is based on a subset of the 2 data that we have here. 
So um, this is something that you've seen for the first half already. So if we look at the QCD static energy that we obtain, then we have as a hard scale, the inverse distance of the quark and anti-quark. And we have as another scale that's involved, the ultra soft scale, which can be understood as something like alpha S divided by the distance. And on top of that, what we have to deal with is on the perturbative side or continuum side, the renewable and subtraction. On the lattice side, we have a one over eight divergence as we go towards the continuum limit. Fortunately, these are both constants. And so we can cancel one in the subtraction procedure and then just fix the two results against each other to get rid of this constant. Or alternatively, we would consider the force and not have this problem at all. So this has been worked on for a while in the past. So we had the two group that sort of did lattice extracted from 2010 to 2019. Then we sort of had this reanalysis of the TUM data by Ayala et al. Uh, two years ago, and then sort of some other looks in two flavor QCD by a group from Frankfurt and Jena, and the Japanese lattice group by Sumino and Al that sort of analyzed the data on domain wall lattices with three quark flavors in the C and the 300 MeV pi and mass and used Wilson loops instead of the Coulomb gauge Wilson line correlates that we use as observables. And that full flavor extension by Tom QCD is ongoing. So Nora explained to you very nicely all the perturbation theory behind this. For us, everything boils down. We have an expression for the force at N3LO, which looks like this. All of these eight riddle, et cetera, are numbers that are known perturbatively. Or we have an expression at N3LO where we have resumed the leading algorithms of logarithms, and then you train this logarithm here on this side for these two lines. Otherwise, it's exactly the same result. And if you send the algorithms of scale to one over R, then these two results will again look the same. So in order to fit lattice results with a perturbative form, you need to make sure that the range is appropriate. Nora discussed this. You essentially have to look that if you go to higher orders, the chi-squared gets better or doesn't get worse or is small enough that it's okay. And we find that for R less than about 0.15 Fermi, this is the case. And this is what we're using here. So for R less than this distance, you can use perturbation theory to describe the data without needing to add anything. And if you go to very short distances, as you see here, then the chi-squared doesn't tell you which perturbative order is better for the fit. Then you can look at these extractions and look at the lambda parameter obtained in this case. And you see here in black the statistical error and the magenta, you see the truncation error from perturbation theory. As you reduce the maximal R value that you use, the statistical error goes up and the truncation error goes down. So the message is clear, make the maximal R smaller. And at some point, these two errors will get to the same size. And that's as good as it gets without higher order perturbative calculation. The truncation errors here were estimated as Nora highlighted by a scale variation between one divided by square root two times the distance to square root two divided by the distance. So it's only an overall factor two, but not a factor two in each direction, or by adding a soft higher order term of this form. Now, in 2019, we tried to do it better. So we looked at the different perturbative contributions in detail in order to understand what is going on when we do the extraction. So you've seen a very similar plot in Nora's talk. We have R squared times the force in perturbation theory divide out here the third power of alpha s as function of one over r. So the two loop contribution in this case is just a constant that's slightly smaller than one. If we compare to this soft contribution at three loop, that's this dash the magenta line, it's substantially smaller as you hope it should be because of the extra factor alpha s that is running here and making this change. Then you look at the ultra soft contribution, which is this flat line at this point. So the ultra soft contribution in this range the R dependence that is coming out of one power of alpha and the logarithm of alpha seems to more or less cancel out. And if you resume the ultras of contribution, you get this dot dashed line that is decreasing. Yes, so what is happening is if you go from the plain ultras of form to the resumed ultras of form, you change the slope of the three loop contribution. If you reduce the slope of the three loop contribution, your comparison to data is going to demand a larger value of alpha S. 
If you sort of have this flat result here, then the slope is larger, so you will get away with a smaller alpha s. And in the 2019 edition, we use the difference between the alpha s values that you get with or without the ultrasoft resummation as part of our truncation error estimate. You can look here on the other plot here at the soft scale variation that we could do here. So we vary the soft scale from two divided by r here in green to one divided by two r here in orange. And what you can see is that it's a non-monotonic behavior that you get. And that non-monotonic behavior becomes really nuts if you, if you go beyond r over uh, left r is 0.1 Fermi. So you should not use these results beyond 0.1 Fermi, at least not with a soft scale 1 over 2r, because there you don't have confidence that you control things sufficiently. And in the past, this comparison that was shown here was done with a scale of 1 over r. Um, I'm hearing music. Is someone else hearing this too? Yes, we hear it too. Okay, um, so if you go to smaller distances here, what you also see that the soft scale depends is essentially completely absent. So our goal will be to go to as small distances in our determination as possible in order to reduce the truncation error. And um, that's essentially the goal of this this extraction. So here we compare the data set that we had in 2014 on the left to the data set we have in 2019 on the right. In both cases, we set the physical scale of the lattice through the R1, which is an uh, um, artificial quantity that we use in lattice. Originally, the underlying quantity the F pi, the pi and decay constant, and then we sort of shift all of these results by a constant in order to agree at R1 as a distance. So in 2014, the smallest distance we could access is 0.04 Fermi. In 2019, we can go to 0.024 Fermi with zero temperature results. And with the finite temperature single free energy results, we can even go to ridiculously small distances smaller than uh, 10 atometers for the first point that we have. The calculation in 2014 had 160 MeV pi in mass. And now we deal with 320 MeV in the zero temperature calculation of the new data. But at the finite temperature, we have both 320 and 160 for some of the ensembles. And we see that there is no visible core mass effect in this case. The old calculation 2014 has been with an errors consistent with 2012. And the new calculation is still consistent with the old one. So what we have to do in order to get something real out of the lattice data. So one of the problems is that we have to go to small values of R over A, which are of the order of one or two or three in order to really probe small distances. And at these distances, we have large non-smooth lattice artifacts in the static energy and the static work anti-correlator, which are due to the breaking of the O3 rotational symmetry on the lattice. And that is because of the particular shape that the gluon propagator takes on the lattice. And you can use this gluon propagator in the Fourier transform to compute the tree level uh, static energy. You can do this on the lattice and in the continuum, and then just take the ratio of these, subtract one, and you get the deviation from zero that parameterizes these lattice artifacts at tree level. And what you see here in blue is a result with the Wilson gauge action. That is something that Stefan Sint has mentioned three talks earlier. What Huzung et al. have been using, and this has gigantic lattice artifacts at small distances. If you go to an improved action, like the Lisha Weiss action here, which somewhat compromises your, uh, your um, unitarity and your transfer matrix at the smallest times, you get much, much smaller lattice artifacts, but again, with a very similar pattern. In this case, at tree level, you can compute this analytically or numerically. Therefore, you can account for this also and remove this from the data. And this is what we call the tree level correction or tree level improvement. When we apply this to the non perturbative lattice data, we can compare it again to a continuum result or continuum estimate. And we see that there is still a residual pattern of discretization artifacts that is very similar to what we had here. It's reduced by something like a factor two to three but it is still there and it has a substantial lattice spacing dependence. And there are only two ways out from this. The first way is we ignore those first six points because they have statistically uh, large discretization errors that are non-smooth. So you can't compare this to a smooth curve and we want to compare to the smooth curve of the continuum calculation. And that would mean that the square root of eight point here 
is the first data point that we can use at all, which greatly limited, limits to which distance we can go down, or we have to estimate these lattice artifacts in a way that we have done here in order to compute a non perturbative correction that is then applied on top of this tree level correction and then include those data as well. And we have to do this in an as bias free manner as possible. So, how do we do this? The first thing that we can do is we can say, look, we have different lattice spacings and we have a factor of four or five variation lattice spacings. And what we can do is we can use data on a very fine lattice and rather large values of r over a in this case we use r over a larger than square root five when we think that the artifacts are mild enough then we interpolate these data with a smooth curve like a cornell ansatz and interpolate it to the distances where we have data on causal lattices that are still affected by these large discretization artifacts because these distances on the causal lattices correspond to smaller value of r over a so in this case, we can compute from this comparison what the residual discretization artifacts are on the coarse lattice and the red symbols in this plot are exactly that being done. We can also, what I, I get come to later, use finer temperature data, restrict them to rather small value distances for each temperature and then play the same game there. And you arrive at the green points that you see in this plot again for this deviation from the smooth function that we get from interpolating fine lattice spacing data with a Cornell form. You see they are consistent between finite temperature and zero temperature. We have an alternative and that is that since we know in principle how the shape is of the perturbative result in the continuum, we can take the perturbative result in the continuum, in this case N3LO with leading lattice of transformation, marginalize over the lambda parameter by using a variety of values and use this to estimate the size of the uncertainty of the discretization effects at small distances r over a in the lattice spacing. Then you get from zero temperature the blue points and from finite temperature again magenta points. And you see they're in essentially perfect agreement. So what we can then do is we can just interpolate this as a function of the lattice coupling or rather the boost to lattice coupling. And you see that at large distances is just a straight line, while at smaller distances, it seems to have some higher order contribution that you have to fit it with at least two different power senses. And then you have this extrapolation of these non perturbative corrections, which in that sense, once we account for this, is essentially our way of accounting for the discretization artifacts and our way of going to the continuum, so to speak. There are some caveats about this procedure. And the first thing is that it's a heuristic procedure. It's not field theoretically rigorous. And we actually can't apply it straightforwardly to uh, the full flavor data that we want to use in the future, because there we simply don't have a sufficiently large and dense set of lattice spacings. And in order to get through, get, get around this, we are trying to do a one loop lattice perturbation theory calculation of these discretization effects to go from tree level improvement to one loop improvement, but that's not done so far. And so this is as good as it gets so far in order to use this small distance data. So what we can then do, you take your results on your static energy, which you see on admittedly a bad scale, but it's necessary to show it like this in this plot. So you have results with different lattice spacings in this plot. The color code here gives you four values of the lattice spacing, blue is the finest, and if you go towards red, that's the coarsest one. All of the data that I colored here have R over A at least square root of eight, such that it can be used in a fit with a continuum curve without non perturbative, only tree level corrections. This fit of the perturbative with the perturbative curve gives you a center value of 0.1167 for alpha S at the Z pole with an error of five in the last digit. You can't see the distinction between these curves by eye. Then we can use this data set with three level corrections at smaller distances. These are these black symbols that you see here in the left half. And you clearly see that they are not consistent with the curve. However, once you apply the non perturbative correction, you get from the black to the gray ones. And they appear to be sitting quite on top of the weak coupling result that has been fitted using only true level corrected data at large distances. And um, then you sort of get confident that this non perturbative correction makes sense. Now you can go to smaller distances. So between the last plot and here, here I showed you 
R1, which is a constant times the static energy. Next, I show you R times the static energy, which has a different shape at small distances. And what you see here again in black, the tree level corrected lattice data. You can clearly see that here there is jumps down where you sort of go from points that are R over A is one to R over A is square root two, square root three, et cetera. It's rigorously impossible to fit these with a smooth curve. But once you estimate the discretization artifacts in the non perturbative correction, you apply this, all of these points align to a smooth function. So this point 1167 is not a fit. It's the result that we had from the large distance. You see, it's essentially perfect agreement. And the good thing that is happening now, is since we use data at smaller distances, our truncation error that we have on top of this is going down. Otherwise, there's not much changing. And if we see that small distances and large distances are compatible with the same curve, we can then also sort of try to combine small and large distances to see which range is optimal for sort of giving us the minimal overall uncertainty. And again, here the color indicates the lattice spacings. Here we sort of have a somewhat wider range of lattice spacings, but we use only the data in this case, which are sort of at sufficiently small value of R over A in order sort of to have this comparison. And so we arrive at a table where we do different extractions. So we either have a minimal R over A value of square root eight, where we wouldn't need the non-perturbative correction, or we use smallest value of R A is one, where we need the non-perturbative correction in order to get something sensible out of it. You see that the alpha S value that we get is exactly the same within statistical errors. We can extract the truncation error either in an approach that is similar to what we had in 2014, where we varied the scale by a factor of square root two up and down, you get a very, very small error that is now essentially commensurate with a statistical error, or we use a wider window of the scale variation, not square root two, but factor two, and then the truncation error estimate that you get is substantially larger. We also include the ultrasoft resummation as an error estimate. So we either resum or we don't resum the leading ultrasoft blocks. That gives about 70% of the lower error in the perturbed truncation error, while for the upper error, it just doesn't matter because the effect is too small. We also use plain two loop result to extract the strong coupling constant. And you see again that between three loop with leading ultrasoft resummation and two loop, there is absolutely no relevant difference. So it's really the same, it's totally stable in that regard. Then we include the lattice scale error that's 1.7 MeV on the lambda parameter, and that translates to something like one times 10 to minus four for the alpha Z pole. And then we sort of arrive at these numbers. And I stress again, the error that you have here is completely dominated by the truncation error. And the truncation error did not go down dramatically because we now use a much wider scale variation window and include the ultrasoft resummation in our error budget in order to be more conservative than we have been six years in 2014. And that's why the decrease in the error is much less than one might have initially hoped for. Now we go to the final attempt of the analysis. We use a single free energy. The single free energy is computed from a thermal width line correlator, but fortunately at very small distances, the thermal effects are up to a constant, essentially invisible. And this constant we anyway sort of have to account for because we have to compare the lattice scheme to the weak coupling calculation using a dimension regularization in the continuum. So in black here, you see the static energy calculated on the lattice on the full data set that we have. And now you sort of see these data at different temperatures and different lattice spacings. And it's just only data in the continuum limit already at different temperatures. You see that at very small distances, it sort of sticks to the zero temperature data and then begins to deviate due to thermal corrections. And if you look at this closely, what you see that actually up to R over A is square root six, you could say that this is just a constant of about 2% of the temperature. And then you see that the different temp NT values, which correspond to different temperatures in this case, start to deviate from each other somewhat. But in this range, we think that we understand the weak coupling, by weak coupling calculations, the lattice spacing, lattice results for this difference. And so once we restrict ourselves to this very narrow range over here, 
We just have a constant shift. We have very few points for each lattice spacing and for each temperature, but of course, nobody stops us from combining different temperatures in one joint fit in the range where these data that we have there continuing extrapolated are consistent with the static energy within errors. And once we do this, we again show the same 0.1167 weak coupling three loop plus leading algebraic transformation result, where we did this fit with only three level correction at large distances. You see in color here data with R over A less than two, where we are very confident their finite temperature effects do not matter quantitatively. You can see in gray the same results for larger distances and then in black for even larger distance. And I mean, what you see is in this entire range up to our race square root 12, you can fit the finer temperature data just with a zero temperature static energy result. There's essentially no resolution of finer temperature effects behind this small constant shift in this data. So we use then the fine zero temperature perturbative data for the static result for the static energy and fit finer temperature lattice data with either NT12 or NT16. And we compare these results to the analysis of zero temperature with the same strict cut on our A down to two as a maximum. That's what you see here. And now with the finer temperature data, we have the advantage that we have this much finer lattice spacings and therefore much smaller distance that we can exhaust. And that's what you see. So with maximum ROA is two or three, we get practically the same answer. Now with our array two and small maximal distance, we sort of have a statistical error that has now substantially increased. So it's now substantially larger than what we get from the perturbative truncation error. Again, we can use the 2014 criteria and then the perturbative error is completely irrelevant. If we use our wider scale variation, it gets bigger, but it's still sort of not substantial. Here, the Ultrasoft resumation is also included in the error and we don't have any substantial difference between the two loop or the three loop extractions. And so we get complete agreement up to minimal changes within statistical errors between the finite temperature and zero temperature extractions. With the added advantage that it's a completely different distance regime where we can do this extraction. Here's a smaller scale that is involved is about 7 GeV. Now, there was this reanalysis done by Ayala et al. of the TUM QCD data, and I want to cover this very shortly. So what this analysis did is they used between square root eight and R over A is four, the finest zero temperature TUM QCD ensemble, beta 8.4, they used three level corrections, and essentially the fit is these seven data points over here. What they did different is they first of all counted the logs, of a higher order as being of a lower order. So the leading logs that we included as a three loop contribution, they included as a two loop contribution and the logs coming from the four loop term were included with a three loop result. And what we showed you earlier is that since the ultras of result logs show you a negative contribution to the slope, including them at a lower order is going to result in a larger value of alpha s or the lambda parameters that you extract, which is what you see in this plot here on the right hand side from that same paper. The C at three level and one loop, there is no impact on what you do with the leading logarithms. But if you start to count the leading logarithms as two loop, you get to this black value here, while if you count them as three loop, you essentially end up more or less over there. If you now include the four loop ultras of logarithms with the three loop result, you have this quite wide gap between the fixed order perturbation theory result that was obtained here and the N3LL result that was obtained there. And in our assessment, it is not justified to resume these logs, even though you can do it, there is no strong argument to do it. And we think that we should not do this. And that's why we haven't done this. On top of this, resumming of the next two leading logs, this analysis used terminants related to the secondary normal on uh, originating in a D3 non local condensate, which give you non polynomial contribution in both alpha s or log of alpha s, which you, of course, otherwise couldn't obtain in a perturbative result. And what these non local con non polynomial contributions will do is as they go here to the hyper asymptotic result, hyper asymptotic expansion result is that the fixed order perturbation to result shoots up quite a lot here because it contains of course now um because it doesn't uh, while the, the the next leading log 
result stays essentially the same as it did without the hyperasymptotic assumption uh, expanded. So this is something that at least I don't personally fully understand. What has to be said on top of this is this analysis does not account for the known statistical lattice uncertainty. It does not do full scale variation. So the one over two R scale is missing in the calculation here for the perturbative error budget. And finally, there is no variation of next leading log versus leading log resummation included in the error budget here, which is why we, we are a little bit, I think, concerned about this, that, so, so to speak. So that brings me to my summary. So if we include this Ayala 2020 result or reanalysis of a subset of the zero temperature dome QCD data, you sort of have this extra point here, the two Takaura analysis use the same lattice correlators between two different analysis strategies and Takaura et al claim that this result is superior because it has smaller uncertainties and therefore this one is considered superseded by them. And now we can compute an average of these two independent two QCD results and one of the two Takaura results and the Ayala result to arrive at these two different average values for the static energies, which are perfectly compatible and are somewhat higher than the bands that we had here that did not include the Ayala, Ayala's calculation in the uh, previous average that we made for the static energy. And so I think we still have a problem with the static energy that it's not completely clear how one should treat the uncertainties that come from doing hyperasymptotic expansion or not, or next leading log resummation or not. And yeah, overall, that's the end of my talk. So we, we improved, I think, in terms of understanding the static energy since the last 2019 workshop. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks. Do we have questions? Uh, yeah, from the audience or from Zoom? Just a quick question. I wanted to understand uh, at which scale the matching to perturbative QCD is done and whether these matching concerns are under control. Um, as, as Nora pointed out, there's not really need to do matching. I mean, what we do is, um, so we have an overall offset between the lattice results for each lattice spacing and the perturbative result in dimensional polarization, which is due to different scheme. And that's just a constant. So we shift the lattice data to uh, agree either at one point or as we do averaged over a certain range to the perturbative results. So we minimize the differences over a range. And we do this uh, for every sort of possible. So what, what we did for our comparison, we sort of generated a grid of alpha S or of lambda input values. And then for each of those, we sort of minimize the difference between the lattice result and uh, the, the perturbative result in order to get rid of that constant. That's essentially what we did, and that's all that you need in terms of matching. Other questions? Okay, so if, if not, thank you very much again. And I suggest that we have now only 15 minutes break and resume at 10 to 5.